Well, welcome back to the Bible Reading Challenge podcast. My name is Aaron Ventura, and today we have some bonus content for you on the book of Revelation. I was recently visiting my family back home in Washington and was asked by my friend, uh, Pastor John Needham, to teach on Revelation 3. And so this is a lecture and Q&A that I gave at Coram Deo Church in Bremerton. So I hope you enjoy. I think that's it for announcements. I told you last week uh, we had a, a, a surprise a guest speaker. And so this evening, uh, Aaron Ventura is going to be... T- speaking, teaching from Revelation 3. It just so happens that he's doing a study through the book of Revelation. Uh, He's a friend of mine. He said he was going to be in the area. And I said, why don't you come? And he said, okay. So he's here to be with us. He is a pastoral assistant at Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. And so he's over here to be with us in crazy Washington to bring the word. So Aaron, welcome. Come on up. And uh, it's all yours. Surprise. I don't know. Yeah. It's good to be here. I'm, I'm from uh, Silverdale. When people in Idaho ask me where I'm from, I say Silverdale. When I was in Florida, I would have to say Seattle because no one knows Silverdale in Florida. So uh, it's really good to be here. And uh, I do, I, this is one of the churches that I uh, continue to pray for. You guys are always in my prayers because um, it's hard to come back to a place that you grew up and see the church be as weak as it is in, in times like these. And so it's good to see uh, John and uh, got to spend some time with the elders today. And um, I'm encouraged that you guys are uh, standing strong in the midst of all that is going on. Uh, let me pray, and then uh, we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you especially for giving us this uh, amazing book of Revelation. I ask that you would guide us as we consider what you have to say to these churches. I ask that you would help us to apply uh, the word rightly, to not be just hearers or even just interpreters of the word, but that we would uh, apply it in our churches, in our homes, uh, as individuals as well. So give us your spirit now, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, John mentioned that I'm going through a series uh, on Revelation so I, uh, um, if you've heard of the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, this is uh, something, the Bible Reading Challenge is something that uh, some ladies in our church over in Moscow thought, hey, we should just read the Bible as our women's ministry. And then they asked me to provide some teaching content on it. And now there's like, I don't know, 40,000 people in uh, this, this group. Uh, so uh, I, I'm trying to just produce content for that. That's one of the, one of the tasks that I have in Moscow. And, and because Revelation is such a challenging book for a lot of people. I thought, well, I'll just do a, a chapter by chapter study through it. And there's, uh, I get questions from people all the time related to different uh, episodes or current events, and they're consistently about eschatology, so study of last things. It's something that a lot of people wonder about and often have not had good teaching on. So if you want to know uh, the crazy things that I believe, uh, you can go, go look for the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, and I'll be going chapter by chapter through that. Uh, I, I've not talked to John, so I don't know exactly how different him and I are on, on different things. We'll find out tonight, perhaps, <laughs> as, I, as I get into to Revelation 3. But This chapter is actually one of the easiest and most straightforward chapters, which might be why John John gave it to me. (laughs) But I I will make it not straightforward, just just you see. Um, So here's what I want to do. First, I want to just take a step back and talk a little bit about the structure. Uh, So literary structure, doesn't that sound fun? But I want to talk about the structure of uh, these seven letters, and then we'll get into the content of them. And then John said I could borrow his kind of outline that he went through. So there should be some continuity, at least with uh, what you've uh, learned so far. So here we go. All of Scripture, but the book of Revelation especially, is a lot like listening to a piece of music, or at least it should be like that. Just think about the refrain that you get at the end of each of these letters. He who has an eye to read, let him read. Whoa, that isn't what it says. It says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So reading the Bible is good. It's lawful. You should. Uh, The book of Revelation actually begins with a blessing for those who read this book, but also especially for those who hear the book of Revelation. And I think there's actually something very different about the way we experience God's word when we hear it. 
When you're reading, you're translating symbols on a page and into images, and that's a different way of, of engaging the mind. You, there's lots of studies on you know, kids who just, just watch TV all day and kids who, who read books all day, and, the, and it actually does something different in your brain. And you think about hearing something. Imagine uh, they didn't have Bibles like we have Bibles on your phone, and uh, we have got a whole bunch of them in our house. So they would have heard the word of God read. That would have been their primary way of experiencing God's word. And when you hear something, if you imagine just closing your eyes, and especially the book of Revelation, this is a book full of images. And it's meant to engage our imagination and call to mind many songs, many things that have been played, many images and symbols that you should have experienced from back in the Old Testament. Because all of you guys know the tabernacle inside and out, right? You know all the furniture. You love when you get to Exodus 25 through 40, and you're like, we're going to read about the tabernacle and the furniture, and we're going to read about it again as they do it. And, and, and that's there for a very specific reason. And then Revelation is going to pick up on that theme in, in this book, as you'll probably get to in chapters uh, 4 and 5. So we experience scripture differently when we hear it. And uh, a lot of us listen to music. If you don't listen to music, you're, you're probably not a human being, right? This is, this is something that we enjoy and listen to. And we need to start thinking about scripture more like a song, more like music. This is uh, the Spirit's symphony, so to speak. So Revelation, like any piece of music, is going to have multiple layers to it, at least if it's good, good music. There's a lot of bad music that doesn't. But uh, if you think about a symphony, it's going to have layers to it. There's a melody, maybe a bass line, there's percussion, there's going to be a change in the tempo, there might be a crescendo, it builds to a great climax. And Revelation is functioning that same way. If you look at the commentators and see the way they outline this book, so you're going to get their commentary, first they're going to talk about the date of Revelation, when it was written, and then they're going to show you how they outline it. And there's actually a number of different ways of outlining this book that all work, right? There's multiple ways of organizing this book, and they all fit uh, together. So I want to look at a few of the themes in this uh, book and use these, these opening seven churches as an example to show you the different layers that are going on here. So uh, if you think about the, the letters to the seven churches— the first layer, we might just say, is the surface layer. It's what, it's what you read, and this is the real historical situation of the pastor and churches in these real regions in Asia Minor. So, I, so that's kind of your just basic surface reading. I believe these are real things, real churches, real places, real stuff that happened in them. At the same time, there's, there's layers here. So let's go a little bit deeper. There is the order of the churches, so if you were to look at a map of Asia Minor, it goes in a clockwise order from Ephesus in the west to Smyrna and Pergamus and Thyatira and Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea, and it goes in a circle, in a, a clockwise motion. And some have actually pointed out that this further corresponds with the seven stars, which they're called the seven stars, or seven sisters of the constellation Pleiades. Now, if you were to look at a picture of the Pleiades, you could just Google this, and then you look at a map of the seven churches in Ephesus, you'll see there's some kind of correspondence there. And the Pleiades, this isn't just from like astral, uh, secular uh, cosmology. This is in the Bible itself. Who can resist the sweet influence of the Pleiades? I believe it has it in the, the King James of Job. So the Pleiades is this constellation. It's mentioned in Job twice and in Amos 5.8. And if you think back to Genesis 1, why did God put sun, moon, and stars in the sky? For signs, for seasons, to track things. They're like a clock. And how does the book of Revelation begin? With a time stamp. The time is near. And then what you have is these letters to the seven churches, and it's like going in a clockwise motion, these seven stars, these constellations, this sign telling you that the hour is close. And so you can almost think about these uh, opening chapters as giving us like the tempo, the pace. If, if we were to use like a, a movie term, this is the like ticking time bomb that's about to go off that builds suspense. And then we're going to explore more of what's going to happen in these 
last day. So the book begins with John saying, the time is near, Revelation 1, 3, and these churches set the tempo. Let's go another layer down. These letters also correspond with the later sections of the book, and they're essentially the whole book in microcosm. So uh, do you guys know what a chiasm is? Maybe just raise your hand if you know what a chiasm is. Oh, okay. So a chiasm is a literary structure that would go A, B, C, B, A. So it kind of works, it, works its way into the middle and then works its way back out. And so you guys know the famous verse, the just shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2.4. And uh, you think, why is Paul quoting this random verse from Habakkuk? Well, that's at the center of the book, the hinge of the chiasm. And if you read, especially if you eventually learn Hebrew one day, which you all should do, because this is this wonderful language, it's extremely challenging, but it's a wonderful language. And you'll see, this is just how they wrote books. There's just chiasms, parallelisms. You see this all the time. Most of you probably know this if you've read the book of Proverbs. It's going to set two things next to, e- next to each other so that they can be juxtaposed. And so that, that's a common parallelism, common structure, and then also the chiasm, super common structure. And the whole book has chiasms within chiasms. So if you were to look at the, the church of Ephesus, this corresponds with the first two chapters, speaking of judgment on false apostles. You move on to Smyrna, and it's speaking of judgment on false Israel, which is chapters four to seven. That's what four to seven is about. You move on to Pergamum. There's judgment spoken on the beast and a prophet, Balak and Balaam. And if you look at chapters eight to 14, that's exactly what's happening. Beasts, prophets. And then you you come to Thyatira. That's the the hinge of the chiasm, the center. And you have judgment on the royal harlot. And you're going to see this harlot riding a beast and uh, the new Jerusalem or replacing her chapters 15 to 22. So these opening chapters foreshadow everything else that you are going to experience in the book. Uh, Let's keep going. Another layer, (laughs) and and this is just in the literary structure of the book. Uh, You have the actual content of each letter and explicit associations with seven eras or seven stages of Old Testament history. Uh, I believe some people have actually tried to say these are like seven periods in our future church history. Um, I think I think that's wrong. Uh, there can be legitimate applications we can make from here. But if you look at the language, as I'll show you, these very clearly correspond with eras of the Old Testament. So you think about Ephesus. And what is the promise given there? It's that they're going to eat from the tree of life, the mention of Eden. So you have this Edenic era. You come to Smyrna, which corresponds with the patriarchal era. What do you have? You have the dead coming to life, like Isaac and Joseph. You have false Jews persecuting the true heir. That should remind you of Ishmael and Isaac. You have the innocent being imprisoned. That should remind you of Joseph. You have 10 days of tribulation. You think of the 10 plagues of Egypt before the Exodus. You come to Pergamum, and this corresponds with the wilderness era from Moses to David. You have the mention of Balaam and Balak, this temptation to idolatry and fornication. You come to Thyatira, which corresponds with the monarchic era from David to the fall of Israel. You have the mention of Jezebel and Ahab. You come to Sardis, which corresponds with the remnant era and the fall of Israel to the return from exile. There's this mention of the few names in Sardis, which corresponds with the faithful remnant. And then finally, you come to Philadelphia, the restoration era. Uh, Actually, this is the second to last one. You have the mention of the key of David, uh, the building of the temple by Ezra and Nehemiah. And then finally, you come to Laodicea, which is the last day's era from Jesus to the destruction of Jerusalem and this final warning that they are about to be spewed, vomited out of the land. And and I'm just giving you like one example for each of those, but there's, there's a lot more to this. So those are just some of the things that are going on in these first two chapters, which invites further uh, study and contemplation. But hopefully it gives you a glimpse into the depths of the music that is happening here. So you, could, you should read through the book like listening to the song for the bass line. And you know, have you ever noticed that? You listen to a song and you can like isolate one instrument that you're listening to or one thing or for me, I kind of space out on lyrics. I, for some reason, I just I don't think about the words very often. So you think about the same thing with, with Scripture. This is the music of God uh, given to us to hear. 
All right, let's turn now to the content of each of these letters. And I'm going to walk through basically John's uh, general outline. And, and here's the four questions we're going to answer as we look at each, uh, each church. So number one, what attribute does Jesus identify himself with? What Second, what commendation does Jesus give to this pastor and, and church? And then third, what challenges are they facing? And then fourth, what is the reward promised to the faithful? And uh, just remember that these letters are given primarily and first to the pastor of the church. So a lot of times we, we skip over that when he's uh, giving the commendation and the challenges. But if you, uh, I would encourage you to read it at some point in the King James Version because it retains the these and thous and the yees and the y'alls, which indicates whether it's a second person singular, one person, the pastor. And at times you can see when it actually shifts into the second person plural, referring to the, the whole church. And, and uh, so these letters are directly aimed, you think, at the elders of the church, the bishop in Sardis, the bishop in Philadelphia, the bishop in Laodicea. So that's the first level of application. And then the pastor as kind of the head of the body uh, in Christ, it's going to be true also of the rest of the body, the rest of the members as well. So just got to remember that. All right. Let's read uh, this first section to the church at Sardis, Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so what attribute does Jesus identify himself with here? He's he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So uh, what are these seven spirits? Well, there are two other places this is mentioned in Revelation, uh, Revelation 4, 5 and Revelation 5, 6. In Revelation 4, the spirits of God are also seven lamps before the throne. In Revelation 5, they are also the eyes of the lamb. And if you're wondering, where does this idea, I thought the Holy Spirit was, was one person. Well, he is. And this, seven, this is more like a seven fold spirit. Uh, think about what it says in Isaiah 11:2. So this is a prophecy of Isaiah about what is going to happen or how you'll know this is the Messiah when he comes. Isaiah 11:2 says, "The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him." And let's count the spirits. Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So this would be one place that uh, John is likely alluding to, that when when Jesus comes, when the Messiah comes, he's going to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Think about also some of the symbols of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Just uh, can you name a few? What are some of the symbols we are given of what the Holy Spirit is like? A dove. Yeah, that's a a common one. What else? A fire. A fire. Yeah, I think of, of Pentecost. What else? A small voice, wind, yeah, breath, the Ruach of God. There is also uh, this uh, symbol of oil, anointing oil. And oil in, in biblical cosmology is, is like liquid light. It's liquid gold, and it's used to anoint kings. So think about 1 Samuel 6, 13. Uh, oil, uh, Samuel comes, and he anoints David. And that's how the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. So uh, sometimes, I don't know if you guys, uh, when you ordain a pastor, you ordain someone, sometimes the elders will lay hands and, and they'll do some anointing oil. Uh, so, so oil is this, this other symbol of the spirit of God. He is the light. He is the, the glory. You think about putting oil on your face. What does it do? It makes you smell hopefully good and it makes you glow. It makes you shiny. It makes you radiant. This is the language, if you think about the Aaronic benediction, the Lord make his face shine upon you. And it's this idea of God giving his spirit to his people so that we start to shine and glow just like Moses did when he encountered 
God's presence. So we all, with unveiled face, are meant to ex- uh, experience this glory of God and be transformed into his image. And one of the ways this is communicated is with this uh, language of oil on the face. So you can put lotion on your face. I guess that would be the, the, the equivalent of it for us. So Jesus is the man who has the sevenfold spirit of God upon him, the complete oil of anointing. And as the son of David and son of God, he holds the seven stars in his hands. These seven stars are the seven uh, pastors, seven bishops. And the image we are given is of Jesus walking among these seven lampstands. Now, uh, think back to your Old Testament. Uh, When did anyone walk amongst the lampstands? Who did that? Priests, yeah. It was actually only the priests that were allowed to do this. And they would have special garments for special occasions. And if you, uh, if you think about the holy place, you think about the tabernacle, the tabernacle is this mini cosmos and it would be dark in there, right? So the, tent, the tent's closed, it's dark in there, except for the only light comes from these lamps. And if you read, uh, so Josephus, he is this Jewish historian. He's not a Christian guy. And he describes the, the history of the Jews. And he actually says these seven stars correspond also with seven planets. So you, you go into the holy place, and what's happening is the priest is ascending into heaven. That's what, also why you sacrifice the animal at, at the door. And, and then there's the baptismal font for, for washing in. And that ascension offering, the sacrifice goes up to heaven. And, and the priest, he symbolically is going up to heaven as he moves into the holy place. And so he is flying around in the, in the holy place. And he's, you know, tending to the, to the lamps. There's the table of showbread. And then to go to the holy of holies, which is the, the third heaven where, where God is, you only got to do that, that once a year on the day of Atonement. So that all of that is going on as Jesus is talking about walking amongst these these seven stars. Um, I want to read for you uh, just as an example of how much uh, he is drawing on the Old Testament, and especially from books that we uh, maybe read once a year. Um, I want to read you uh, Zechariah chapter four. Uh, Because this is one of the, the texts that he is drawing from. And as I read this, I want you to just think about all the things, if you've read the book of Revelation, that are pulled from this, this chapter. And I've got the King James here, so this, this might sound a little archaic for you guys. Uh, but this is, this is Zechariah 4. And the angel that talked with me came again and, w- and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold, a candlestick, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me saying, this is the word of the Lord unto, unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, cryings, grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet. That's a measuring line. uh, In the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven that are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, in future weeks, as John continues to go through this, you're going to find olive trees, two witnesses, more of this language. And you start to see, okay, we can't just free associate when we come to Revelation from what we think a lamp is or what we think a light is or what we think an olive tree is. These have a very specific theological meaning from the Old Testament. So the first thing we always have to do is go see where has this already been, been talked about in the Old Testament. And you'll see uh, there's also four horsemen, like all these things that you're going to encounter. And uh, 
knowing Daniel, knowing Zechariah, knowing Ezekiel, these books that we uh, don't read very often, will help you so much uh, understanding uh, this book. All right, I'm going to jump, jump ahead here, see how, see how fast we can go through all this. Um, what are the challenges that this church is facing? Well, uh, to start, they have a, a, a hypocrite for a pastor. So he has the uh, appearance of godliness, but not the power uh, thereof. He has the outward appearance of being alive. So you might think he has a good reputation. He's well known. He gets invited to speak at, at conferences. But God who has the seven eyes, he sees down into the depths of man. He can see this pastor and knows his works, that they are imperfect before him. And so uh, that's a great challenge for you as a church, right? If, if your church has a dead pastor, the rest of the body is not going to be very healthy. Think about what Jesus says in Luke 640. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So think about this. You can't really surpass the people that are teaching you in godliness, knowledge, etc. You would, you'd have to get it from somewhere else, right? Whether we like it or not, we become like our parents in a lot of ways. Things that they did that annoyed us, we start realizing, oh, I do, I do the same, same thing. And, and, and so we, we're becoming like those that we are being taught by, receiving instruction from. And that's a really dangerous place to be for this church, that their pastor is this, this hypocrite with dead works. And of course, what are you going to see in the church? More of, more of the same thing. So uh, the solution for Sardis is first, well, the, their pastor needs to repent. And this is what Jesus commands him to do in verse three. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent, right? He's saying, if the pastor, the pastor is supposed to be calling dead people to repent and come to life. And here you have, he's the one who needs to sit down and, and hear a sermon from Christ, which is he needs to repent. Yes, pastors have to repent too, and the assumption here is that if this pastor and the elders of the church return to Christ and strengthen what remains, right? So they're dead, but they're also dying. So they're not, there's, the hope is not completely lost. If they repent, they will be revived. And if you remember, this corresponds with the remnant era where there was a widespread apostasy, deadness in the people of God. And yet God did great things for them. The nation falls to Babylon, but God preserves a faithful remnant. You remember uh, Romans 9 talks about this, but Elijah thought he was the only one. So he's out there killing prophets of Baal, and then Jezebel comes after him, and he thinks, I I just wish I could die. But God says, I've actually preserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee. I think this is a point of encouragement for pastors especially, but for all of us who feel sometimes like we're the only one, right? Everyone's out to get us. The culture is against us, but it's just us here. And God says, no, there's actually a bunch more. And so uh, get out of your feelings, all right? Stop throwing a pity party. There's a lot of faithful Christians. You just don't know them, okay? So, but God, he sees all. And so we should be encouraged by this. No matter how bad it seems, there are lots of faithful Christians all around the world, praying and serving God faithfully right now. We need to be reminded of this. It's funny that a lot of people, uh, they have embraced the church going into uh, exile. They have what's called like exile theology. We are just the faithful remnant holding on. And I think, okay, if we, we, could, we, could, we could go that route and say, oh yeah, the church is in exile. What happened to the church in exile? Well, there was this guy named Daniel and he actually became the second uh, most powerful person in the entire kingdom. At one point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, gives this decree in Daniel 3.29. He says, any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made in ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So, there's your freedom of religion for you. But, but, so this is the church in exile. So this is your exile theology. And what do you have? God sending, raising up Joseph-like figures like Daniel, turning the heart of the king so that he actually decrees that Christian, Christianity, the worship of the one true God, is the only legal thing you can do in his kingdom. And so if that makes us uncomfortable, then... Uh, 
Maybe, maybe we need to, to think about this text some more. Think about what does God actually want? I think the first commandment actually forbids uh, worshiping other gods. So that's what we're, we're actually supposed to be calling our nation to repentance from, right? They're worshiping all other kinds of gods, and you have all sorts of Christians saying, we need to go back to the Constitution, back to religious pluralism. But that, that's not what the first commandment says. No, there is no toleration of idolatry that is permitted in the law of God. And when you do that, you're going to incur the curse of God. So Sardis is dead. This church is dead, but there is hope still if they repent. Finally, we come to the reward that Jesus promises to the faithful. He says in verse five, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So uh, white garments, they are, they're clean clothes. They're symbols of righteousness and glory. Uh, it might even refer to the resurrection body. You think of Paul talking about his own body like this tent that he's going to put off and be further clothed. So th- there's this idea of your garments are also kind of your, your resurrection body that awaits you. And then you have this mention of the book of life, which uh, Jesus says he will read and confess those names in it that are not blotted out before his father. So only those who persevere in faith will not be blotted out. If this pastor and church does not repent, this is a real threat that they will be removed, blotted out from uh, the book. Uh, Moving on to the church at Philadelphia. Let's read uh, verses 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." All right, attribute here, he's holy, he's true, he has the key of David. And uh, this language of the key of David comes from Isaiah 22. And if you were to read the context there, God is kicking out, he's deposing the steward of the monarchy at that time. I believe Hezekiah was the king. And so uh, if you, how many people have seen or read the Lord of the Rings? All right, and repent if you have, if you have not. No, so so uh, in the Lord of the Rings, there is this steward of the throne of Gondor, and this is Denethor, and he's, he, he goes back and forth with Gandalf in this war of words and, and cunning. And what is Denethor? He is not the king, but he's been the steward. His house has been uh, responsible for taking care of the throne, making it ready in case the true king, in this case Aragorn, comes to the throne. But what has he done in the meantime? The king has it come, and he's essentially said, you know, I think I like being the steward. And he essentially acts like he's the king. And he says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stand aside and let this ranger come in and take my place, even if he has the rightful claim. And there's something similar happening in Isaiah. So God is, uh, there's the, the steward Shebna and then Eliakim. And God says, You're, I'm gonna raise you up, but then I'm gonna drop you down. He, he uses this metaphor of like a, a clothing hook that you put in the wall and then you put way too much weight on it and then just breaks. This happened at my house. This is why I know. Uh, but but that's, that's the example, this peg in the wall that's going to become so heavy that it actually falls out. And so here now, Jesus is the one who has the key of David. There's no steward, right? It's the, the Messiah, the Son of God has come, and he has all power, all authority in heaven and on earth. And who does Jesus give the keys of the kingdom to? He gives it to the church, specifically to the elders, to the pastors of the church. And that's who he is addressing here. So Jesus is the one who can open and close doors as he sees uh, fit. Uh, What challenges is this church facing? Well, these faithful Christians, and if you've read the book of Acts, you know, Paul's policy was, I go to the synagogue first, 
And then when they kick me out, then I go, I go preach to the Gentiles. And so there constantly, the open door of the temple is now closed to the Christians. They are the ones being persecuted. We also know from John 10 that who is the door? Jesus is the door. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the door of uh, the sheep. So uh, some say this open door here is a open door for ministry. Uh, That's the way Paul actually uses it multiple times. There's an open door here for me. And it's funny thinking, don't we use that when we're like, we're looking for a job or looking for an opportunity, looking for an open door? Well, where does that come from? Okay, well, it it comes from, I don't know, the pen of Tyndale translating the Bible, this metaphor of an open door for us. But it could be an open door for ministry. It's possible. I think it's probably referring to the open door that Revelation 4 starts with. So uh, Revelation uh, 4 starts with, after these things I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And so that open door, when you get to chapter 4, you're in like the control center of the universe. There's beasts and elders and praising God, and you are in the throne room of God. So this is access to the one who can open and shut things as he sees fit. And that's actually how the church, us rascally bunch, actually have great power and authority. We reign with Christ because we are united with him. Ephesians says, we are seated with him in heavenly places. And how how can that be? Well, because Jesus has opened the door. And so when we come here on Sundays and we worship and we pray and we preach and we take the Lord's Supper, when we do all these things, we're we're in heaven. This is what Hebrews 12 says. When you come to church and the pastor, when, when the service starts, you start singing, you have ascended into the throne room of God. So this is uh, uh, what uh, is offered here. Uh, either way, Jesus is the open do- open door. He's the one who opens and shuts. And even if the synagogues, especially here, the synagogue of Satan, as they have become, have been shut in their face, the place of true worship Jesus Christ, the throne room of God, is always open to those with faith. Now, the book of Revelation describes first century events, but it is applicable just like all of Scripture is to our present day. And one of the major themes in Revelation, as as you'll see in future chapters, is that the church essentially has two major enemies. It's other Christians, what is here called false Jews, so false Christians, and then a tyrannical government. And they're, they're going to show up later as the beast. So there's a sea beast and, and there's a land beast. You have Judaizing uh, false Jews who are persecuting them, of which Paul, the apostle Paul was a part of. And then you have the Roman government. And you think about who, who did Jesus get killed by? Well, he got killed by a conspiracy of Jewish false Jews and the Roman government. And this is the theme that we're going to see over and over in this book and also uh, in history, even, even to this day. So we should expect and not be surprised when this same cycle happens. Um, moving on to uh, answer question number two, what commendation does Jesus give to this pastor and this church? Well, in spite of all of the persecution, the, the tyranny of the government, the slander and lies from false Christians, this pastor and his church, uh, they have stood strong. It says here, you have a little strength, but have kept my word and have not denied my name. So this, this church has been weakened by persecution. They've endured slander of other so-called Christians. And as a reward for their faithfulness, Jesus says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I'm going to keep you from the coming tribulation. Now, uh, number four, what is the reward that Jesus promises to the faithful. Well, he says, I'm going to keep you from this hour of trial, which is going to come upon the whole world and to test those who dwell on the earth. Uh, I want to just briefly rabbit trail on this because uh, one of the uh, ways that our uh, Bible can trip us up sometimes in the translation is you read a passage like this and it says, there's an hour of trial coming upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And that sounds like the end of the world. Like, how could this be talking about first century events. And so here's just a a quick Greek lesson for you. So there's kind of three words that you really need to know, and uh, uh, you'll see them in here. So the first word is oikumene. And this this, this is the Greek word here when it says, come upon the whole world, the whole oikumene. And this is essentially the Greco-Roman world. And it's a special, unique word that refers to uh, what is spoken of in Daniel, these four kingdoms, these beasts that come. It's the dominion of the beast. That's the oikumene. And to give you an example of this, in Luke 2.1, so Caesar Augustus makes a decree that all the world, 
oikumene should be registered. You think about this. He's taking a census of the whole world, but this is not a census of people in, you know, South America, okay? So this is, this is a specific word, oikumene, that often gets translated in our Bibles as, as whole world, and it's referring to the whole Greco-Roman world under the dominion of, of this beast. This is a different word from the earth or the land, which in, in Greek is teis geis, the land, geis. And you think, who are the people of the land? The people of the land are, are the Jews. This is the circumcision. And if you look at uh, how this, this phrase, taste gaze, gets used, it, uh, it's used 12 times, and it's refer, it refers to the Jews, to the circumcision, to the tribes of the land, the tribes of the earth, which is by this time uh, apostate Israel. So you have the oikumene, upon which uh, this hour of trial is going to come upon the whole oikumene, and it's coming there to test those who dwell on the earth referring to the land, the people of uh, the land. And you, you'll notice this is in contrast to the people's tribes, tongues, languages. That's, that's the Gentile. So these are uh, symbolic words that are pulled from Old Testament. Uh, it's picking up from the Old Testament narrative. Then there's also this other word, and this is a word that we actually know in English, cosmos. This is a Greek word. And this is what we typically think whole world. So Jesus died for the, the cosmos, for the, for the whole world. And that's another one that's going to show up in here. So the hour of trials coming upon the Greco-Roman world to test those who dwell in the land, the Jews, the tribes of Israel, the people here. Uh, So this this great tribulation is a first century event, and you're going to see how this unfolds. Remember, this book begins with the time is near. It's about to happen. The clock is ticking as we go through each of the, the seven letters to the seven churches. And finally, we come to the church at Laodicea. What attribute does Jesus identify himself with? He says he is the amen. Now, amen to us is a very common word. We say it before we eat. You probably said it a a number of times today already. And this is is almost like Christianese for us. But if you actually look at the usage of amen, amen, in, in the Bible, you'll see it's actually very infrequently used in the Old Testament and every time it is used in the Old Testament, I think it, it only shows up, let's see, it only shows up 27 times in the Old Testament, and then there's like 50 times in the New Testament. But of these 27 times, 12 of them show up in Deuteronomy 27 when the people are swearing covenant. So you remember, uh, there's some, the six of the tribes are on Mount Ebal, and the other are on Gerizim, and they're calling down these curses. They're saying, we're going to keep this law, and then everyone says, amen, and they do that 12 times. So amen, always in the Old Testament, is a covenant oath. You are swearing an oath. So when we say amen, it's actually one of the weightiest words that you can utter according to the, the biblical usage. And interestingly, this is, all, this is how almost every single New Testament book ends. It's how, it's how every gospel ends. I think it's just Acts, uh, James, and 3 John that don't end with amen. This is really unique. It's as if God is adding books to to the new covenant. This is, these are covenant documents, and that's symbolized by amen. It's not just a pious thing, all right, and this is how I end my book, a- amen, like sincerely Paul, amen. No, this is, this is him calling down the covenant blessings and covenant curses from God. So we should think of it more with the solemnity that a, 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 stu- a husband and a wife are about to be say, I do. Okay, it, it's that level of seriousness. In fact, I'd actually say it's way more serious than that because you're calling upon God to bear witness and to act according to his covenant, which is a dangerous thing if you've been disobedient. And it's a great thing if you have been obedient. So Jesus is the amen. He's the faithful and true witness. And then he's also called the beginning of the creation of God. And this isn't saying that Jesus, uh, there was a time when Jesus didn't exist. This is saying that he is the the ruler. He is the, uh, in Greek, it's arche, and it refers to his preeminence over all creation. And you could also think about it this way. Jesus is the beginning of the new creation in that he is called in the parallel passages, the firstborn from the dead. So, so no one rose from the dead like Jesus did. And, and what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 5? All who are in Christ are what? New creation. 
So, so Jesus is actually the, uh, chronologically the beginning of the, the new creation. And we know from elsewhere in scripture, you think of uh, John 1, G- the Logos, the Logos existed before creation existed. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. So Jesus, Jesus is all of these things. And he is coming to give a commendation, a word to this pastor. And sadly, he has nothing good to say about this pastor. He is lukewarm. He's not hot like a strong cup of coffee. He's not cold like a glass of ice water or lemonade. And because of this, Jesus is threatening to vomit this pastor out of his mouth. Now, this idea of vomiting out of Jesus' mouth comes from Leviticus 18, where the threat is if these nations commit these these crimes, and Leviticus 18 is this list of sexual sins, uh, a lot of it is like sins of incest, sins of homosexuality, bestiality, etc. And God says, don't do these things because it's for uh, the nations breaking these laws that I am vomiting them out of the land. So that's where this comes from, vomiting out of the land. And you think about here, who is the land? In Revelation, who's the land? Je- Jesus is. D- Jesus is now the land. He's, he's making all things new. He is the new creation. And he is he's the one who incorporates people into his body, the church, or he spits them out. And so this is referring to excommunication. Right? This is what church discipline is. If, if you've ever eaten something or gotten food poisoning, you know that you, you want to throw up because <laughs> you're going to feel a lot better afterwards, right? And that's, that's, that's exactly what's happening here. Jesus has said, I'm eating you, right? This is what happens in communion. We eat, we eat one another. We partake of Christ. He partakes of us. But if there's something lukewarm about you, Jesus is like, uh-uh. Like, if, unless you become hot or cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. So this is a threat of church discipline, of being excommunicated from the body. And remember who it's aimed at. It's aimed at the pastor. It's aimed at the one who's supposed to be exercising church discipline amongst the flock. And there's this uh, major theme in all of these letters that there needs to be church discipline in the church. That's almost the, the consistent uh, encouragement and uh, chastisement that Jesus gives. Y'all need to kick some people out. There's, there's people in here, there's a Jezebel, there's false teachers, there's people who say they are Christians and are not, and, and you are not exercising church discipline. This is the same thing that Paul uh, got, uh, uh, said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. So, Unless you're hot or you're cold, Jesus is going to spew you out of his mouth. I'm going to jump down to uh, uh, the final part so we can get to some Q&A here. What is the reward that Jesus promises to the faithful? The reward for repentance is the opposite, of course, of being vomited out of Jesus' mouth. You have this language of he's knocking at the door. He's going to come in and he will commune with you. He will come in and dine with you. And he says, to those who overcome, he promises that they will sit down with him on his throne. If you look at uh, the other chastisement this pastor and this church received, is that they, they're rich, they're wealthy, and Jesus says, you're actually wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Right? They become self-sufficient. They don't even know how bad things are. And, and God says, unless you repent, you're going to be, be kicked out. And so it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven. It's hard for a rich church to remain faithful. It's hard for a wealthy pastor to not lose sight of things. And the heart of man craves these riches, craves this wealth. And Jesus says, you need to crave the true riches. To take a line from Jesus, he says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, you think about the converse. What does it profit a man to gain his soul and lose the world? And Jesus' answer is everything. Right? You gain your soul, but you lose the world, and you actually get to live in the new creation, in a resurrection body that doesn't have colds. You're going to not have any aches and creaks in your body. There's no tears. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no death. As Tolkien says, all the sad things come untrue. And you want to exchange that for, I don't know what, 30 years, 50 years, 70 years of a cushy lifestyle here? 
right? The, the, we should desire riches and wealth and power and authority. It says in Romans 2, to those who seek for glory, honor, and immortality, they will receive it. But you must seek it in a non-self-seeking way. You need to seek the things that are going to remain. Anyone who's invested money knows it's dumb to make very short-term investments. And what is uh, settling for this world but a really short-sighted investment? Jesus offers to let us sit with him on his throne. And so may we. Let me close in prayer. We'll answer some questions. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for how you speak to us from it. We ask that you would embolden us, you would encourage us, that we would have a good conscience, a sincere faith, a holy love for one another. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So one of, the, uh, one of the joys of getting guest people to come speak is like getting people who can speak better than you. <laughs> you did not disappoint, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So first, what we're going to do is, if there are any kids here who have any questions, you want to ask a question, put your hand up and we'll do it. We'll give you, we'll give you a shot to ask your question before we go to slido.com. So any kiddos got a question? I'm looking for hands. I don't see a hand. Okay, we're going to go right to Slido then. Okay, you ready for the first one? Yeah. I'm just going to read it to you. Okay. My eyesight is so bad. I have the huge iPad. Oh. It's the old man <laughs> iPad. Okay, question number one. If amen is such a powerful world, a word, should we use it as often as we do? Uh, it depends on how often you use it and in what context. So... I think the pattern, I think it is right that we use amen a lot because we have uh, greater access to uh, the blessings the, uh, and, and the curses, the judgment of God. And Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to, to pray amen. So the Lord's Prayer is a pattern for Christian prayer. And, and I think we want to be careful to not blaspheme, just like we shouldn't be saying things like, oh my God to mean not, oh my God, help me. Uh, so I think it, it just should cause us to pause and say, have I become like uh, the people that Isaiah speaks about who blesses God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him? And so I think it's important for us to remember what amen means and, and then mean it when we say it. At the same time, I'm thinking about, like I train my son, we pray for our meals. Dear God, thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. And he knows, amen. And, and he, he doesn't quite know all that he's doing, but he's supposed to grow up into that. So mm -hmm. I think we should use it, but we should uh, use it uh, knowing what it, what it means. Yeah, good answer. Um, when is your next album going to drop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you should do it on Revelation. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have any plans uh, of making more music right now. Okay. So maybe in, music, maybe in right. like uh, 20 years when I'm old, I'll, I'll, <laughs> co I'll come back out of retirement. <laughs> well, you did, the, you did the five points of Calvinism, right? Yeah, that was my swan song was five points that of Calvinism. It? I'm happy with that one. And uh, we'll see how, how, uh, how time treats it. Okay. You could do the seven churches. Yeah, I could, I could do that. <laughs> that was my question, by the way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, a little lost on three, chapter, uh, chapter three, verse five. Does he blot out names, take back salvation? Yeah. So this is a, tri this is a tricky one. Um, so what you have to do when you come to a question like this is make sure it harmonizes with everything else the Bible says about salvation, can you lose it, etc. cetera. Uh, sadly, the whole kind of once saved, always saved, that... Uh, typically does not do justice to the full uh, biblical doctrine of what we would call perseverance. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have passages in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 that says there are people who taste the heavenly gift. They've experienced the powers of the age to come. These sound like Christians. They sound like baptized Christians. They sound like people who take communion, who are in the church, and they are. 
Uh, John 15 talks about people who are in Christ, branches that are unfruitful that get cut out. So I, I do believe there is a category for someone being in Christ, referring to in his body, in the church. They're, they're a member, they're baptized, they're in covenant with God. And yet because they don't keep covenant, and remember, what is the condition of the covenant? It's faith. And who gives you faith? God, it's a gift of grace. So uh, God gives persevering faith to the elect, and those are the people who will never be blotted out of the book of life. At the same time, there are many tares amongst the wheat. There are people who are these synagogue of Satan, these false Jews, false Christians, and God really will, I believe, remove them from the body, just like he'll vomit the pastor of Laodicea out of the body. So we don't want to try to, uh, we don't want our systematic theology categories <laughs> right. to squash out the meaning of this text as if he, he won't actually blot you out. No, he really will. And we want to be able to say that about every passage in scripture and not do the, the kind of, these passages cancel each other out. Mm-hmm. Passages never cancel each other out. If you don't know how they harmonize, it's going to take some work. There are challenging ways of doing it. But we can't just say, well, here's my verse and here's this verse, and it equals zero. Yeah. So that would be my one kind of caution for people as they think about that. Yeah, you touched on systematics where systematics can be really helpful, but there are certain times where you can take a system and force on a text and go, where does this text fit in the system? Yeah. And that's the, that's the wrong no, question. The it's the text first, yeah. right? It's always the text first. Okay, um, there is a white forerunner in the parking lot with its lights on. So if you own a white forerunner, um, we should all put our heads down and pray. And then the first. <laughs> okay, you got it. There you go. We just want your battery to die. All right, great question. Um, <laughs> this may be a while. Please review your initial chiastic outline of the seven churches and the subsequent chapters. Email me at aventura at christkirk.com and I'll email you. I'll email it to you. A Ventura, okay. <laughs> yeah, or Aaron Ventura at gmail.com. A Ventura at Christkirk.com is my, my church address, but either of those, send, uh, email me and I can send you stuff. I really appreciate you doing that, by the way. Because <laughs> I didn't do it in chapter two because I didn't have enough time, but the outline of past oh, yeah. history and yeah, that was, and then the outline of the rest of Revelation was really great. Um, what does it mean to be hot or cold? Yeah, so some people take this as like, only being hot is good, and then the cold is like, at least be really bad if you're going to be, be bad. And, uh, Sin boldly. Yeah, I, I, don't th- I don't think that's what he's, he's saying. Um, I, I'd have to look at the text uh, to, to walk through all the reasons uh, why. But so I, I take it, so some, you read the commentators and they say, well, in Laodicea, there were these fountains of water. And mm. by the time that it got to the city, it was lukewarm. And I'm just like, okay, how long is that actually going to last? So I, I am suspicious of some of the attempts to read uh, uh, possibly unreliable external sources on, on Laodicea and then make that into my meaning. So I would want to look, so I looked first at the scripture, are there any mentions of hot water or cold water? Well, there are mentions of cold water, and they're positive. It's in Proverbs, which speaks of uh, the the gospel coming, a a good news proclamation that's like cold water to to someone. So it's refreshing. Uh, There isn't anything about hot water Mm -hmm. there. Uh, So I'm I'm thinking, this is something that's going into Jesus's mouth. So I don't think it's bath water, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take a bath in a, in a nice hot tub, which, which might be nice. So I think it's probably referring to a beverage of some sort. So we all know you're going to either drink hot tea or you're going to drink something cold. And so I, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's actually a very simple yeah. reading of it. And we sometimes overcomplicate it. Uh, yeah. beyond a necessity. Sometimes the commentaries can make it too difficult. Yes, absolutely. Right. absolutely. So you just think like very, very, just very <laughs> earthy level, a cold drink is refreshing yeah. right, on a hot day and a hot drink is going to uh, warm you on a cold day. But nobody ever orders a lukewarm yeah. drink, right? They're in, they're and in when Starbucks, you put it in your like, mouth, can I get it at do? room temp? Yeah. <laughs> You're a well, sociopath maybe some cubes, if you're right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I heard it's better on your gut to, eat, uh, to drink lukewarm water, but I don't, so that could be the only reason I could imagine someone doing that. But In England, just they, the, they drink rumor. kind of room temperature beer. Beer, yeah. But we're, we're, not, we're not there. We're not there for sure. <laughs> there, th- that wasn't to around the church, when Jesus To the church this. in England. <laughs> Hear what the Chill Spirit says. <laughs> 
Okay, I think that's all the questions we got. Let me check if there's any more that just came in. No, that's it. All right. That's it. So thank you guys for being here. Aaron, thanks for yeah, thank sharing you for, with us. for having me. Uh, if you want to talk, you have questions, please feel free to come up. We'd love to hang and, and chat with you. Uh, otherwise, would you pray for us and we'll be done? Yeah, absolutely. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for your, your body throughout this region. I ask that you would make uh, Coram Deo more salty, uh, more light, that you would make them a city set upon a hill that people look to. And uh, God, I ask that you would continue to protect uh, your bride, that you would uh, defend her against the foe, and that you would cause her to continue to be fruitful and to multiply her disciples in this area. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all just said amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Yeah, and you mean it.